Hi everybody, my name is Ricky Howard and I have a, a five piece blues funk band called Mudbone and uh, we play at this place in Naples uh, every Tuesday night. We've been doing it almost seven years and this guy named Bob came to see us and from the very first Tuesday night we played Bob and Diane were there. They've been supporting us every week. They're a big fan of our music and we love them. Over the years as I've gotten to know Bob, you know, I've become familiar with some of his passions, music, hiking, but of course top of the list would probably be the Constitution. And that's really why he chose to go to law school, to clerk, to join Cato as a senior fellow in constitutional studies in order to defend the Constitution. And I think that work and focus has continued even as he's become the chair of Cato. So when you think of Cato's work in defending the Constitution and our Center for Constitutional Studies, of course we think of its founder, Roger Pallon, but we also think of Bob Levy. I just can't explain how you do what you do. I think that if someone were to write a, a book on the history of libertarian thought in 25 years or 40 years or 50 years, that uh, Bob Levy would play an important role. Well, for me, what comes to mind is a good friend and someone who is, um, has tremendous integrity and he's the kind of person you can go to to talk about anything, you can entrust with anything. When I think of Bob Levy, I think he's just a really good guy. You know, he's committed to what he believes in, but he's very focused on that. But ultimately, he's just a very nice guy, good guy to get to know. Bob, to me, is is a is a is a very complex individual. I think it's I think his history sort of indicates that that here's a, here's a, here's a man who built and sold a successful business, decided to go back to school and study constitutional law because of how important he thought it was to the future of our country. Uh, Bob's one of the uh, superbly rational people that one encounters in life. There aren't very many, really. Uh, his analysis and decision-making is really stands out in that respect. So he's just had a firm commitment to the rule of law, economic liberty. Um, so Bob and I clerked together for Judge Royce Lambert on the D.C. District Court. And before that started, Bob reached out to me by email to let me know that there was only one parking pass for the two of us and that he'd like to drive um, if that would be all right. And I was already planning on taking the Metro, so I said, yeah, that's fine. And then Bob insisted on calculating the value of the parking pass and splitting it with me down to the last cent, uh, which is how I discovered I'd be clerking with a free market libertarian. I think um, the most surprising thing about Bob as a clerk was his, his modesty. I mean, his accomplishments were really remarkable. He had a PhD, he'd built a business, He'd gone to law school um, probably 30 years uh, after most of the other students would have done. I walk into the class, he's sitting in the middle of the front row. It's a relatively small class, and he's sitting there with this twinkle in his eye, like, I'm not going to learn from you. No. <laughs> he comes into my office uh, looking for a job. Here's this old guy coming into the office. I kind of felt sorry for him. I mean, he looked like he might have been down on his luck. and. Uh, I, I look uh, at his paper and I see he worked his way through high school and college playing piano in a brothel. He played his way through jazz clubs in Washington, D.C. Um, to support himself when he was a student at American University. He was a very gifted semi-professional tennis player. But the thing that might surprise you the most about Bob Levy is that I would say about two-thirds of the really funny, dirty jokes that I know came from Bob while we were clerking together. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to think of something that can go on a public forum. <laughs> of course, I can't, in a mixed company, share any of those jokes. Yeah, I can't. There's not a single one I could tell. You know, I had long thought about retiring from Wall Street before my three daughters went off to college. And I had considered attending law school and studying constitutional law, and I wanted to work at Cato or IJ. And I sought Bob out for advice when I discovered that he had followed a similar career path. And, uh, you know, so I got some advice from Bob, but I thought about it, and it dawned on me that Bob followed a second career where he ended up working for Roger Pallon. I said, I'd rather do this my own way. So now Roger Pallon works for me. I think that's a lot better. It's illustrative of Bob's character 
that as soon as he was graduated from George Mason Law School, he turned around and made a gift, a substantial gift, that supports Levy Fellows to this day. 1986, Henry Manny became the dean and put us on this law and economics path that we've been on to this day, which is in and of itself a very remarkable thing for a law school and actually for just one individual to have had that impact. But I don't think that impact would have happened without Bob's investment in a school without creating the Levy Fellows. I think, I think one of the key illustrations of Bob's character was his interest in funding the Heller case and his ability to not only sort of assemble the legal team, but to behind the scenes orchestrate the whole case and then because he felt it was so important, actually self-fund it. He and uh, Clark Neely had gotten together and said, now is the time to do this. Uh, we don't want this case, this issue of the Second Amendment to be decided on a dirty case where there was some guy who held up a 7-Eleven and then got extra uh, a penalty for illegal gun ownership. We want to have this a clean up and down case on the constitutionality. And you know Bob is just one of these sort of quiet performers. He didn't have to be the leader of the effort, he didn't have to be out in front, he didn't have to have his name all over everything, but every step of the way uh, Bob's influence was there, Bob's support was there, and the case never would have happened and never would have been as successful without his participation. Bob put all the money into it himself. And what was remarkable about that was I offered as a plaintiff, I said, I'll put in a little bit of money. I'm, I'm not as wealthy as you are, but something. He said, no, I need to say, this is just me doing this, not the gun lobby, just me. And if I say me and some other people, it becomes a confused story. So he said, thank you very much. I appreciate it, but I'm just going to do it this way. And that was a smart thing to do. It'd be hard to choose what, is, what was the most insightful thing I've ever heard Bob say. but. I think his um, defense of the right to bear arms, which I've heard more than once, uh, is about as good as it gets. And I've gotten to watch him progress from a new scholar to a board member to the chair of the board at a very, very difficult time that he led the Institute through a lot of what, 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 what could have been um, serious and sustained injuries to the organization. If I were to, to think about all the people I've known in the course of, of my life, and certainly involved in the liberty struggle, um, I think Bob's really a hero. One of the special things about joining Cato as president is the community that Cynthia and I have become a part of since we moved to Washington, D.C. And we've developed so many close friends with the generous people who make Cato's work possible, our sponsors. And as a result, we have enjoyed some pretty special moments. One of the most memorable of which was recently when I was dining with a couple who had been longtime and generous sponsors of the Institute. And they told me that they wanted to make one of the largest gifts that Cato has ever received. And the purpose was twofold. One, to affirm the strategic direction that we're taking in an effort to keep Cato principled, but also try to continuously challenge ourselves to increase Cato's impact. But they also wanted to uh, honor someone, and it was a, um, it, it is really a tremendous statement uh, about them that they want this gift to be anonymous. And they were insistent that I be the only one at the Institute who knows who is giving this gift and one of the reasons they want to give it is to honor our chairman, Bob Levy, and in particular to recognize the tremendous exertions that he's made over the years in order to defend the Constitution. And so in honor of this gift, the Cato Center for Constitutional Studies will henceforth be known as the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be able to share this information with you tonight. Bob, from me, Cynthia, our children, future generations, thank you for all you've done to protect liberty in the United States, to defend the Constitution, and to advance the cause of limited government. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for your friendship, your mentoring, and everything that you have been to the freedom movement. Um, and from Nikki and I, thank you to you and Diane um, for both of your friendship 
and we wish you many more years of happiness. Bob, thank you for everything you've done for Liberty and all for the ways that you've enriched my life personally. Bob, I have grown to truly value your friendship during the time I have known you as a Cato Scholar, as a board member, and as the chair. I want to thank you for that friendship and what you have done for the Institute and for the cause of Liberty. Bob, it's been a great ride. Thanks a million. You've been a great asset to the Center for Constitutional Studies, to the movement, and for me, you've been a great personal friend. Thanks, Bob, for coming my way, for working with me for a year and being a friend for 30 years. Thanks, Bob, for making the Levy Fellowship possible. I wouldn't be where I am today without it. Bob, you're the only student who ever bailed me out of jail. I really very much appreciate it. So, Bob, thank you so much for being there and supporting my music for such a long time. No, it sucks. Uh, and if you're out there in the audience, um, I hope you're awake and reasonably sober so you can actually hear some of this. Thank you.